This section is an introduction to allele translation and we'll cover the basics of going from raw base calls to phenotypes and we'll also describe what phase ambiguity is. The basic data pipeline in DMET console is to take a pair of files for each sample, a sample file which has sample information and a cell intensity file and for each pair of files perform basic genotyping to generate uh, a chip file. From here you could also just export the raw genotype results in which case you'll get base calls for every marker in this underscore gt file and only copy number information if you'd like in the copy number file. This is the minimal data pipeline. However one of the other things that you can do starting with the raw genotypes is to perform translation on it to further digest the genotypes into commonly recognized star allele names and phenotypes. What is allele translation? Well, it helps to start with the reference information uh, that's available to DMET console. I picked one particular gene, UGT2B7, which has seven markers. Uh, in addition to that, we have defined star allele names. So what is a star allele name? Well, it's actually a pattern of genotypes across the markers that are used to do naming. For example, we have six markers here that have a reference base and a variant base. And for the star 1A allele, that is the name for when these first six markers all have the reference genotype in a particular sample. The star 1G allele is almost the same as star 1A, except that the fourth base is showing a variant. Star 2C has four variant bases, and so on for up to star 3. So the star allele names are a way of summarizing the pattern of genotypes from individual markers into uh, commonly recognized names in the literature for people that study this gene. Part of the reason that people summarize these into different allele names is because they also, as part of the studies, try to determine the activity of the allele. These arrows at the bottom uh, are a way of describing the uh, nominal activity that we're associating with each of the star alleles for DMET console. The seventh marker is not used for haplotyping in that its reference or variant status, C or T base, does not impact what star allele is called. This can sometimes happen when the authors that define these haplotype names are not looking at the universe of markers known for that particular gene. And so the state of that marker in any particular star allele name is unknown. And as a result, this will sometimes happen. Some of the genes will have a subset of markers being used for haplotyping, and then the rest of them are just there to report uh, the raw gene types are not used to determine star allele names. Well, what do we do with this information? Let's uh, match it to some data that we have for three samples. For this gene, sample one, we have a pair of genotypes, one from each parent. And for sample one, we have the reference base. Uh, we're reference homozygote for five of the six markers, and we're heterozygous variant for the fourth marker. The first part of haplotyping is to determine what pair of star allele names is consistent with these observed genotypes. So for sample one, it's fairly obvious that the only combination of star allele names that is consistent with the observed genotypes are star 1a, star 1g, one from one parent, one from the other parent. As a result, the predicted uh, star alleles for that sample are star 1a, star 1g. Sample 2 has a pattern of variant calls that is only consistent with being homozygous for star 2C. You get that allele from both parents. So they're being called star 2C, star 2C. Sample 3 has a pattern of variance that is only consistent with star 2C for four of the markers and star 1G. So that's what's being called. So for these three examples, 
there's only one combination of star allele names that predicts uh, the observed uh, genotypes. For some of the genes for which we do star allele reporting, we also go ahead and report phenotypes. And that is basically by comparing the predicted star alleles against their known allele activity and coming up with, first, a pair of predicted allele activities. For sample one, it would be a pair of two normal activity alleles. For star 2c, it would be a pair of two increased activity alleles. And for sample three, it would be a combination of a normal allele from star 1g and an increased allele from star 2c. So when we see a pair of normal allele activities, the DMAC console will report that sample as being an extensive metabolizer for UGT2b7. For a pair of increased activities, that's called an ultra-rapid metabolizer, and for a mix of allele activities like this, it's called an extensive or ultra-rapid metabolizer. It's a single call code that reflects that. So this, in a nutshell, is allele translation, starting from the raw genotypes to the phenotypes. If you would like to review the definitions of the star allele names that DMET console uses, I refer you to a library file that is in the library folder used by DMET console. One version of the file ends in dot translation, and that's the actual library file used for allele translation. In the same folder, there's an Excel uh, version of that same content, but reformatted for clarity. This Excel version also makes sure that you don't accidentally damage the translation file actually used for translation. So this is meant just as review. The bottom half is the same UGT2B7 table you saw in the previous slide, and I'm pointing out how the actual information is stored in the translation table for the same gene. You'll notice that in the star allele definitions that the only cells that are filled in are for variant bases. When it's a reference, it's assumed. It's, when it's empty, it's assumed to be the reference genotype. All of the markers on DMET Plus will report marker level genotype information. However, only a subset of these will get the full allele translation all the way to phenotype calls. As of the library files that are being referenced here, this information here is current. So considering that we have 231 genes on DMET Plus, we do a first level of translation on 79 of those genes. And that first level is going from base calls to reference or variant calls. And you'll see those in the translation comprehensive report. A subset of those 79, or 49 of those genes, we use this information to make diplet type calls, or pairs of star allele calls. It's being done in a subset because for some genes, the literature hasn't defined haplotype names. And for a subset of those 49 genes, as of this version of the metabolizer file, we take this combination of star allele names and report the gene activity pairs and the predicted phenotype call. In some cases, the pattern of observed variance isn't consistent with one single pair of star alleles. Here's an example for TPMT, where looking at only two markers, we have the, the X represents a variant call. And in the example at the left, what we have is a variant call for the SNP on one of the copies of the chromosome, but not on the other. And for the second SNP, the variant is on the same copy as uh, the first variant, and the other copy of the chromosome doesn't have a variant. So if the variants actually looked like this, then that sample would be a star 1 for the wild type, chromosome 1, and star 3a to define the pattern of variants on the second copy. However, the software can't tell which strand or which copy of the chromosome uh, the variants are on. For example, they might as just as well be on opposite chromosomes, but only one. Each chromosome has its own variant. 
In the case of the right, that would be called star 3b for the top allele and star 3c for the bottom allele. Well, what's the impact of this? DMET console, since it can't determine which of these options it is, it reports both. It may very well be true that in the population it's much more likely that the option on the right uh, is, exists than the option on the left, but we're not using population frequency information to predict the more likely diplotype. So instead, DMA console reports both. It will report star 1a, star 1, star 3a, and as an alternate possibility to report star 3b, star 3c. Well, what's the impact of this? Um, they have different pairs of enzyme activities. Star 1 is normal, star 3a is no activity, which, and the phenotype for a pair of normal and no activity alleles is, is called an intermediate metabolizer in this interpretation. The other pair of star alleles are both considered reduced activity alleles and for this interpretation we're saying a pair of reduced activity alleles is called an intermediate metabolizer. So in this case even though two different pairs of calls were made they resolved themselves to the same phenotype. So that's fortunate. However in some cases when multiple diplotypes are called they do lead to multiple reported phenotypes.